uh, we did what we could do to make sure that we established um, some of the basics that you can do uh, in the county. Uh, and so as people began to come back on, if you had any questions over that part, feel free to open up and let us know uh, because it's really, really important for us to answer as many questions as we can. But it's also vital that uh, your questions from last time don't get overlooked as we push forward to information this time, okay? So if there are any questions before we start over last week's coverage, uh, go ahead and just raise your hand and, and we'll get those out of the way right now. Yes, Andrea. Yes, hello, you can go ahead and talk, please. Andrea? Andrea, you can. You the mic is open for you, Andrea. You should have. Um, you should have access now, Andrea. Uh, we cannot, or at least I cannot hear you, Andrea. And it might mean that you might have to jump off and jump back on again. Uh, you might have to refresh your screen, but we won't go anywhere without you. Okay. So um, do if that if that's necessary. Hi, Michelle. Good to see you back again, Miss V. Very good to see you all back again. So we're going to slow things down a little bit. And we're going to focus on, uh, because there's so much content in this next section, we're going to focus on breaking the information down um, into smaller components because it's important that you all capture this. And for your own personal business, if you're a trainer, it's important that you also slow down during this segment because we're starting to talk about numbers. And everyone knows from their education, perhaps in the United States, that everybody made numbers super fun. So, uh, if that's true for you, that's great. If yes, not, <laughs> if not, then we're here for it. So, Andrea, can you try again for me? Check, check. Can you guys hear me? One, two, one, two, coming right back at you. Big 41 okay. top. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. So my question specifically is about sole proprietorship. Um, do you need to have a, um, a TIN or an EIN? I know this is very specific, but do you need to have that for your business or can you just go off of your social security and do you recommend that? I know every situation is a little bit different. Brilliant question. Brilliant question. To recap her question, Andrea is saying in a sole proprietorship, could I just use my social security number? I mean, why do I have to go and get a TIN, a TIN, a TIN or an EIN or a BIN? Why do I need any of that stuff? And the reality is, is that it's solely for your, um, for your taxes. So if you feel after you've done your homework that you don't mind your um, your business being part of your personal taxes and your personal liability, then so be it. But oftentimes entrepreneurs find it more relevant for the longevity of managing risk to remove their social, their personal social security from interacting with business. For instance, Everyone doesn't have the greatest personal credit. So when you start your business, you might think to yourself, well, I'm going to start a business in my name. I'm going to have the Rodriguez Towers. But you may discover that Andrea Rodriguez may have exceptional credit, but maybe a little bitty thing that keeps businesses from wanting to loan her personally money to start this business. But when you create Rodriguez Incorporated and you start to try to get loans 
in Rodriguez incorporate its name with its own E-I-N, well, that has no history whatsoever. So you start brand new. And then lenders have a choice. Hmm, do I want to give them a business loan or not? Does that answer your question? Yes, that does. Thank you. Now, there's a lot of meat to your question. So what was your follow up question? Because I know you had one. Um, well, I'm just in a in a pickle right now because I'm trying to figure out if I want to. Um, I had an LLC, but I closed it in uh, 2019, right around the pandemic when it hit. So I am kind of coming back in and I'm like, well, it's better for me to be sole proprietary because my fitness Pilates business is still like new. And um, it was, I think it was better for me to go sole proprietary, but I went LLC. So I kind of jumped ahead and I wasn't making the revenue. So um, that's kind of why I was asking that question. Um, and I had an EIN for the LLC. Um, but now, as far as from what I've done my research on, I don't think I could use my EIN for my sole proprietary as I'm like restarting back up again. You're absolutely right. You cannot uh, use your EIN for a separate entity um, that was filed for the LLC. Now, if you're is the is the LLC that you you allow to um, to close, is it completely closed? Did you allow it to close with the state? Um, yes, I allowed it to close with the state. I think I still need to file like an, um, like one last 568, uh, SB 568 from like my taxes, uh, which I'm in the process of doing right now. Okay. So you currently don't have any business structure open at all. That's correct. Okay. Very good. Okay. So you're going to start from scratch now. Um, yes, that EIN expired with that LLC. So, um, now Unfortunately, that doesn't mean that your bank accounts, if you had a bank account open, that doesn't mean that that bank account expired. That bank account could still stay open when your your LLC closes. Uh, however, if someone were to look it up and they'd say, well, why am I doing business with somebody that doesn't have a uh, an active business with the state of California? They could see that. OK, so uh, something else I want you to think about, Andrea, and, and anyone else that has questions pertaining to this, just raise your hand and we'll get right to you. Um, something else I want you to consider is that what happens if someone gets injured while doing yoga with you? What have you done to manage your risk management in that way? I have um, insurance that, that I'm in the process of getting, but I've been under um, a studio. So while I'm like setting everything up with my sole proprietary, I'm still under the studio, quote unquote. But this is like my month to get everything taken care of, my sole proprietary, my, my uh, insurance, so I can be on my own. Okay. And do you think that, do, are they forcing you to remove yourself from their insurance and have your own solo insurance um yes they're not forcing me i feel like they're kind of like gi giving me my wings to fly okay 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 um and will you take any clients prior to obtaining this uh insurance uh yes i uh the the clients that i'm working with i'll still continue to be working with them and i feel like it's kind of like the push that i need right now to like um go even further with my under my brand okay um the only advice i would give you there is to be mindful if you ever have a lapse in coverage between your studio and your own business taking over the insurance that it will be you personally held liable for any injury that occurs um, if it is a result of their interaction from your class. Uh, does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So just want you to be mindful of that. Um, and this is not speaking as legal advice. This is simply giving you business management advice, uh, risk management specifically, and that sort of thing. All right. So any other questions from the floor over last class? Any other questions from the floor? Thanks, Steve.
Oh, no worries, no worries, no worries. Any other questions from the class? Any hands raised here? Now, before, I, I know you all remember, we had Satoshi, and we Satoshi was so, so generous to allow me to use one of his amazing outfits, one of his amazing branded shirts as an example with the $10 example. And many of you had amazing comments on that. But today we're going to dig into something even more fundamentally sound um, concerning that. And it's going to be personal and business finance basics. OK, and we are so blessed to have Malcolm back with us today. Um, we are going to jettison and allow Malcolm to come on in, um, tell us how he's doing and then to also uh, start us off here in this in this particular area. Um, and please let me know again, please let me know if you have any questions along the way, raise your hand and we'll be able to stop the class and answer your question because this is not meant for speed. This is meant for understanding. OK, this is meant for understanding. So um, let's go ahead and I'm going to close it out here and turn this over to um, Malcolm. Do you want to drive or do you want me to drive? I can drive for now. I was having some um, connectivity issues earlier, but I think they resolve themselves. So uh, if they come up again, I'll let you know. <clears throat> OK, OK. And do you want do you want to uh, do you want to manage the screen or would you like me to? Uh, I'll manage the screen for now. OK, very good. I'll close out of this one. Go ahead, Malcolm. Awesome. So let's get started with money management. Who on this call likes what you can do with money? I'm raising my hand if you can't see me. I'm, I'm, I'm raising it really high up into the ceiling, into the into the that stratosphere. So I'm going to take that assumptive uh, uh, close here and say that most people here like what, what money can do. But the real challenge that most entrepreneurs and, per, and individuals, citizens themselves will have is how to manage their money and ask critical questions such as how much should I sell my product for? How do I know I am making money? When do I start to pay taxes for the money I make? Um, are there any free tools to help me manage the money I make? And so what we're going to do is use this section. Um, like, like Steve mentioned before, is slow down and use this section to focus on um, really a framework for how to look at money's management, um, how to develop that framework into an executable daily habit. And then from that daily habit, how do we start to figure out end states for ourselves? So mental model, daily habits, end states. Moving on. So the first node here is personal finance. Um, we're going to use the definition of all the decisions and activities of an individual or family regarding their, their money. But really what we're talking about is stuff that we deal with every day from how much shall I spend on an Uber to get to my job, or I guess that's what we used to do in the before four times. Uh, but things like how much should I spend on Amazon, you know, for this particular, uh, you know, domestic item or household item or, um, you know, which is the best um, Uber Eats option. You're constantly trying to manage your personal finance and especially in today's pandemic. And so personal finances is the catapult for a healthy business um, regime, fin a financial regime. And, um, and so we're going to go into some of the details of surrounding that. The first tenet, or I guess pillar of effective personal finance, and by you know second derivative going to be uh, business finance, is budgeting. Now I'm going to take a pause here and ask people how many y'all love budgeting. Notice the the, the slur, <laughs> the, the emphasis on the love. Oh, Steve, Satoshi, uh, I, I'm a Satoshi. I want to hear Satoshi's answer. 
No, just saying I, uh, I agree. Awesome. So uh, I, I see people saying that they enjoy the budgeting. Budgeting, all jokes aside, budgeting can be extremely difficult. And for a lot of people, um, whether it be new entrepreneurs or large multinational organizations, this is the crux of a lot of activity. And um, oftentimes mental power, um, psychological power is developing a budget. So what are some of the features of a budget that make it effective and useful? Um, a budget has a time period or duration. So 60 months, 60 minutes, a day, however long it may be. Um, has specific financial goals, $5,000 by you know, Q4, $300,000 by the end of the year. Um, a, good, um, a good budget also has bite-sized uh, money goals. So goals that um, can be achieved along the way to some of the bigger goals. And then some of the techniques down here that we have for uh, personal finance goals can be a framework called the 50, 30, 20 rule. Now, let me take a pause here. Has anyone actually ever heard of this rule before? Uh, just, just raise your hand if you have. Um, if you haven't, um, that's fine as well. Okay, so we got uh, dry icing saying that He's seen it. So the 50, 30, 20 rule speaks to the concept of for every dollar you get in, let's say we have $10. You have $10 come in. Five of those $10 need to be for your, uh, your needs. Another three of those $10 need to be for your wants. And then those last $2 need to go towards um, savings and debt repayment. Now, how many of us are, are, are even close to that or trying that? Or maybe we got our own framework that we're doing. Yes, Steve. All right, All right. actually, dry ice, hit me with it. Um, so I kind of do it a little backwards. Um, so I save a good majority of my stuff and then the smallest amount would always go to my like once, and then I would always go um, mainly with my needs. I like that. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to change. I'm gonna have to reconsider mine. <laughs> Anyone else, Steve? I, I was. I was just saying that. I think that. Um, so when you're asking people to raise their hand, I think sometimes people are just raising their hand um, to um, to say yes, you know, or amen, or hallelujah whichever way people go with that um, at, at some point as well um, but also um, for the entrepreneurs in the room uh, have you ever struggled with finding money to do things with in general and let's say you are super frugal I mean let's say you made you know four or five hundred dollars a, a week how am I supposed to budget does anyone ever have those challenges you can answer in the chat box. Yes, no, I'm Gucci, maybe. Anyone? Can you restate the question? Does anyone ever find themselves looking at the money they have coming in and saying, budget what? Um, so like with me, I make sure that whatever, whenever I'm doing business, especially for like something that's custom, um that i incorporate the cost of materials inside of the budget and that that'll be the down payment plus a little bit on top just to you know cover an event that they're like oh i'm okay i don't want any more like because at that point i'll just be stuck with materials and you know no money left for myself um i like i said before like when i do budget even if it's like a little bit it could be something as small as ten dollars at least eight or not eight, not eight like maybe seven of those seven of those dollars probably either going to savings or needs. And then whatever little I have is just what little I have. Like I'm not gonna really focus on my wants as I am gonna focus on my needs or what I need to save for a later time. Okay, that's that's very interesting, especially in the um, in the in the brand business there. Angel, what about uh, the cannabis business? How's that look for you when you first started up your company? I don't know if you could hear me, Angel. Um, I was 
I was directly speaking to you on that one, but Angel might be busy for a second. Sorry, sorry. Can you ask the question again? I I didn't get a chance to hear. Forgive me. No, no, no. When you when you first started your cannabis business, uh, how was it for you just starting up? I mean, I mean, talking about the first month or two. So yeah, I'm to be 100% transparent. I'm still in what I call the infancy stages. I'm currently working with the job developer to finalize the business plan, the, he sent me a, like, uh, a, uh, a business plan template where I kind of just fill in the blanks with bullet points and little sentences here and there so that she can finalize it in the end. Um, a lot of this is gradual because I have, like, my actual career that I'm focusing on and trying to excel in, too, and not trying to take away from that position, you know, while, you know, trying to pursue my own my own my own business so i'm trying to make sure that i'm i'm giving it i'm giving enough time to my to what's essentially giving me my livelihood but i have been able to finalize the logo with a graphic designer who actually does graphic designing work for other dispensaries or other cannabis brands um yeah so that's kind of where i'm at right now uh the llc application i submitted a while ago and i haven't heard back from the secretary of state yet uh, but the name of my LLC is Carry On. Uh, my last name is Carry On, C-A-R-I-O-N. But the name of the business is Carry On, like Carry On Bag Luggage. Uh, you know, essentially trying to help the community carry on. But, uh, yeah, I, I, if you have any further questions, I'm, I'm more than willing and open to answering them. But, again, I'm in I'm in my infancy stages of, of the business. It's in an, I'm still trying to figure out, you know, I'm trying to have my own niche. I don't just want to focus on cannabis products. I also have experience with, operationalizing nonprofits, so maybe even having or incorporating some sort of workforce development aspect to it where I have centers for folks to drop in and get help with their resumes and applying for work and things like that because these are systems or, or things that I'm already familiar with. Um, and even case management, providing extensive case management services or wraparound case management services. Uh, so, yeah, sorry if I spoke a lot or digress, but that, that's kind of where I'm at right now. Well, no digression there. Actually, this leads us into some of the very valued points having to do with this discussion. One of the things that you mentioned here is capital, um, capital investment. So you're you're actually putting money into your business right now to get it started up from the LLC cost, um, like uh, Andrew said, Dry Ice said. Um, I I'm going to spend some money on this fabric or whatever I'm buying for this client. So I'm going to charge them up front in their deposit for it. Um, Keyshawn, Apollonia, Michelle, Satoshi, do you find this to be the case for you? Do you have capital expenditures where you're pouring money into your business? Satoshi says yes. Apollonia? Keyshawn? I'm sorry. Did did I accidentally raise my hand? Uh, no, no, no. I'm just asking you, have you poured money into your business that you had? You're starting off and you're pouring money into your business, oh, your own personal yes, money. Absolutely. I've, I've spent thousands of dollars. Thousands point. of like dollars. I, I thousands. lost count. Okay. Yes. Very good. Very good. Keyshawn, I don't have a business yet, so no. But Keyshawn, have you tried any marketing? Have you spent any time on researching your business, Keyshawn? Uh, yes, I have. But as far as like, um, I guess, expense wise, no. Keyshawn, I'm going to tell you right now, uh, I'm going to disagree with you. Okay. I'm going to say that each minute and second that you put into your business is your time value. That's called sweat equity. OK, so right. now I want you to consider because as an entrepreneur, I actually want everyone in the room to consider themselves to be an attorney. OK, um, do attorneys just say, uh, you know what, I'm going to charge you every time I see you? Yeah, some do. But most of them have a, a rule called that they're going to charge you by the billable hour. OK, and they set an hourly rate. But they can't just charge you for an hour if they see you for 15 minutes. They have to charge you for the 15 minutes. And then they have to charge you for a three-minute phone call and a 30-second text. Okay? So your sweat equity that you put into to, uh, uh, your own business is a value. It has a huge value. So I think that 
each one of you have something that you invest in your business. While you may not have to see it in dollars and cents, you actually need to make sure that you're valuing the time that you put in as well. Right, Malcolm? I would I was going to not to dig deep into that rabbit hole, but yes. <laughs> So, so Malcolm, oh yes, Apollonia, please. Yeah. So I was wondering if, if that was bad, should I, should I actually be keeping like track of every like cent that I put into the business? Because oh, at this Apollonia, point, did you say bad? <laughs> Apollonia, we don't use moral constructs in business. Apollonia. Right, right, we can say right. what what I'm what I'm gonna say to you to help you reset your narrative is that Thank you. it's 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 not it's not bad. It's just simply we have um we have positive uh positive outcomes for our spending and we have negative consequences of our spending. And the sometimes the positive outcomes of our spending is when we keep track of things, we are able to assess where is that money benefiting us. If we don't happen to keep track of them, so one of the negative consequences are that we may end up spending more than we need to. And we might end up repeat spending on something that we've already spent on. Going back to what Malcolm said this is the budget this is the budget right malcolm yeah and to to really dig to really dig in, into that i think one of the challenges that teams have okay, so are you ready for hold on what is that no oh, sorry no um, it wasn't you malcolm it's okay okay I think one of the challenges uh, that we have, and not to get too too far off track here, is the term budget from a stigma standpoint makes people shudder and fringe. And so once you get past that part, you, you really get into the nuances of how money is supposed to flow. And so our goal of this class is to reorient you to how money is supposed to flow so that when you feel like you've made these mistakes or when you feel like you've had this guilt about an expense, you're able to center yourself and say, okay, that was a learning opportunity. What did I learn? How do I stop, you know, how do I prevent said learning opportunity, you know, mistake from happening again and move forward? And so that's really what enables, um, how do I say, uh, successful entrepreneurs to move forward is their orientation and conversation around budgeting and money has to be one um, of not bad or wrong or right or wrong, but of is this a learning opportunity or you know did we learn from this or did we grow from this? And um, so that's that's why I kind of put it this this slide of why we were talking of debit and credit and how to manage these things. Um, it's because tr effective entrepreneurship is understanding these these concepts and a, a number of other ones. Um, in such a manner that you're comfortable not only talking about it with your lawyer or your accountant or whomever else, but you're also able to communicate this to other entrepreneurs as well. So with that, I want to jump into the credit versus debit. Really, really, the slide should be called credit and debit, not versus, because you're going to need both to, to achieve the, the goal. So debt, I'm pretty sure everyone is familiar with. Uh, we are in America. Uh, credit, I'm pretty sure everyone's familiar with. We are in America. Uh, but really, what with the slide I want to talk to mostly about is the behaviors attributed to these tools. Um, debt is often used as a tool in, in, in business as a means to, to, for, for, to use my uh, southern uh, term here, to add gas to the fire, you know, you just gotta, you gotta be gonna be cooking, you know, you gotta get the fire going, and debt has, you know, it has that effect to it. Um, in the VC world, it's called leveraged. You'll hear this term a lot. This we use debt to leverage X, Y, and Z, or 
We use our credit line to leverage that, 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 et cetera. The goal I'm trying to get to this class here is understanding that there's different types of debt that, um, that are available to an entrepreneur. And with these types of debt, um, if, if used correctly, can enable you to grow your existing business. And we will go over th those specific flavors um, later in the slide. The second tenet of effective business is credit management. This component really speaks to understanding what um, lenders look for when, when they, they offer credit. What are you supposed to use that credit for? In this particular case, um, whether you, let's say you run a, let's, let's use Satoshi, for example, and I'm gonna use him um, in this particular case. So feel, uh, feel free to speak up Satoshi if you want. Let's take his t-shirt example, all right? It's January 1st, 2022. Now, what kind of debt would Satoshi have if he's starting this t-shirt business? Well, in an ideal world, Satoshi would have, let's say, um, an account payable or say, you know, he, he got a, a thousand shirts um, from a vendor and he doesn't have to pay them back until two months from now. So, he, you know, he's got he's got that up front. So that'd be a debt for him. OK, is that that accounts payable for the shirts. And let's say that I know that in order to keep the business going, he has a credit card to pay for his website so he can take orders. And so that costs him $79.99 a month for whatever tool. Now he can use that credit card to purchase the, uh, the software here. What I'm trying to illustrate here is that the way Satoshi manages that debt and credit at that point in time in this particular example um, is frugal. What, what makes it um, irresponsible or what makes it um, a learning opportunity, I guess we should say, is let's say Satoshi doesn't, you know, spend money, doesn't use those shirts. To, he doesn't sell those shirts. He does something else. He spends his time selling knickknacks or whatever it may be. He, he, he doesn't actually turn over the inventory. So now we start to get into this third column over here of how to manage the debt and credit responsibly. And so those these next couple of slides is what I want to use to kind of go into that. I'm going to take a pause here because I know I just kind of introduced a lot of different terms here that some folks may not be familiar with. So I want to um, take a pause here and before I go on about debt and credit as a mental model and before and really go into the execution part. Poloni says leveraging using using debit to buy. Uh, assets credit. So Apollonia in this slide, this is debt. So we were using debt to buy um, assets and that's correct. Um, this capital, this sort of mental model. I'm sorry, capital. I'm in, I'm in debt. Okay, no, okay, in okay, debt. okay, okay. okay. <laughs> all right, all right, sweet. All right, yeah. So, all right, we're on the same page. Anyone else have any questions uh, about this particular slide before we go into like the execution part? And we are going to give you all enough room to ask questions. Uh, this is this is such an important topic that we cannot stress enough how many business owners don't understand debt and credit and how they affect their business long term. So please, if it's something that you're like, oh, I'm, this doesn't affect me right now, pause for a moment and reassess that narrative in your mind. Because ultimately, debt and credit are rolling with you all through your personal life. So it's not going to be any different when a business comes online. And so, Malcolm, go right ahead. Oh, Satoshi. Oh, go ahead, man. We, we yeah. using you as an example. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. So um, I'm kind of at the uh, cut of avoid borrowing money you can't repay um so like everything's getting pretty expensive especially shipping things from china and like right um you know even the the cost of like the garments themselves and i'm i'm finding myself at just the cusp of like spending money that i might not be able to pay back like immediately 
Um, but I'm already like barely like in debt too. And so I'm just kind of wondering like, you know, in that, in that sort of event where you're kind of at the point of like no return, what, uh, what can be done in those sort of situations? Um, Satoshi, I want you to just, just wrap what you just said in in a in the ball i want you to wrap it in a ball and on the outside of that ball i want you to write the words account receivables and account payables okay okay if you consider your debt like you have a mason jar everybody know what a mason jar is that little glass with that little gold looking thing on top could consider you put all your debts in that mason jar those debts are your accounts payable? These are fancy accounting terms. Malcolm could dig into it deeply. He went to school for this. These are these are fancy accounting terms that just may, basically means as a business owner, you get a pass to decide where the accounts payables and the account receivables go. Now, if we take all that fancy stuff out of it and just make it make sense, you have a light bill that's due at the end of a month. If you don't pay the bill, the lights get turned off. Off. Same thing would happen in business, except once you've already paid for something from your from your vendor or your supplier, you receive that material. Then what you receive without sending them money becomes an account payable to them an account receivable from the other side so if if i'm if i'm the company you're shipping it to steve and i shipped you a thousand shirts now you owe me money that for me that's an account receivable if i turn it back around and satoshi now you're the person that receives the thousand shirts but you don't have the money to pay me that's called an account you you're looking at you're looking at steve's steve's shirt enterprises you're saying, well, I don't have the uh, money to pay Steve right now. So that's an accounts payable. I got to pay that out to somebody. You're never in trouble if you can slow down and stop for a second and say, wait a second. I'm not selling as much. Things are too tight right now. I need to slow down my supply of buying and sell more things. And so that means you might need to tell your customers, we're going to wait list some items. So if you're looking for that special edition shirt 002, you're not going to get 002 for maybe a month or so. You're on the wait list to receive the shirt pre-order. Does that make sense, Satoshi? Very much so, yeah. Do you think that you could try those things? Yeah. I think um, also one of the things that I'm sort of struggling with is that I think I have enough to launch, yet I feel like, if, you know, intellectual honesty is like something that I really stand by, and if I were to be completely honest, I think I have a fear of success. Did you say a fear of failure? Success. A fear of success? Yeah. Oh, thank you so much for saying that, Satoshi. So let's, let's, let's go ahead and hammer out this part right here. Malcolm we're not going to move on as we plan because ultimately this is the plan. We want everybody here to talk about those real things. So let's talk about those real things. Satoshi says, I perhaps have reflected in myself and I have a fear perhaps of success. We don't, we don't open that can of worms of where those things might come from in this setting, but I can say that each one of us carries some level of a fear, okay? So other people might say, well, I have a fear of failure. Some people say, well, when, it, when I get close to the starting line, I don't know what's going to happen to me. So I don't want people to talk about me. Like Apollonia just says, I'd be the first in my family. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't know what, what's going to happen if people see me in this light. Being equitable with yourself first saying, I'm being real with myself. If I step out on this ledge and I don't make it, ain't nobody there to catch me. There's no safety net. People have already talked about me. 
Said they think I'm a dreamer. I always have my nose in the sky, my head in the clouds. But again, Satoshi, what's the worst thing that can happen to you if you start? Well, I have to think about that one. Um, yeah, I can't. I can't think of anything. Anybody in the room? What's the worst thing that can happen to you if you start? I'm gonna go first. Okay. I'll be explicit. My 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 my. What used to hold me back before uh, some personal events came up was, I didn't think I was a. I was ready for the world that I envisioned. You know, when you when I had the expectation of what I wanted in my end state actually exceeded what I could handle mentally. And so it took me personally some time to resolve those two things. Andrew. Uh, I was just saying, like, I guess the worst thing that could happen if you start is that you fail, in which that could be subjective because failure can also be seen as a lesson um, in which business often has like a lot of lessons. Okay, and Satoshi. Yeah. Um, I think it's uh, being in the same league as you know those who get heckled and who praise for what they do. I feel like the the chaos of like uh, you know, uh, being a business owner scares me a bit. So, so you're so to re repeat what you're saying because I'm having just a, I'm I'm having just a little bit of a difficult time hearing what you're saying. Um, what what I think you said was that is being in the arena with other business owners, uh, kind of yeah. a humility. Is that correct? A humility. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And Apollonia, you had you had you had said something as well. Oh yeah, I just wanted to uh, follow up with. Um, I believe that was uh, Steve or so someone who just spoke uh, about about failure. Just uh, I'm just feel like failure is a part of success, and that you never really fail. That is just like lessons and stuff that are learned. So I just feel like the worst that could happen if you start is that you fail, but then you have the opportunity to start over again, and you know better. Okay, so so that leads us to Andrew because I'm going to speak on that in just a second. Andrew, what do you say? Um, I just wanted to piggyback on what Satoshi had said about being in that arena, which is something that I can sometimes, or is something I can resonate with, is that you know, in the event that you know I happen to find that mystery ingredient and it just works and it's successful, is having to not only upkeep that um, that like level of like success but then also having to figure out like what is the next step from this like wow like i i went out there put myself out there it's successful not only do i have to like keep it up but now i have to like sit there and outdo myself what does that even look like that can be stressful to a lot of people it can also it can also be like very overwhelming okay so so when you think about that that term overwhelming uh andrew and satoshi and apollonia um that the term overwhelming is that is that being overwhelmed enough to prevent you from stepping up into the place of letting the world see all of the work that you've been putting on behind the scenes Um, not for me. I feel like it, it lights it lights a fire inside of me. I feel the fear and, and I do it anyway um, because I just, I don't know, I, I'm fearless at times. And what about you, Satoshi? Uh, can you repeat the question? What is that is being overwhelmed enough to stop you from moving forward to show what you've been working so diligently for so hard for the sleepless nights, the 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 anxieties that you've had over us is, is am I good enough? Is that overwhelming enough to prevent you from stepping into and, and saying here, this is what I produce world. This is what I've been working on.
Can anyone hear Satoshi? No, All right, I can't hear him. No. Okay, great, great, great. You're back. You're back. Is it yeah. enough to keep you from stepping forward? Yeah, definitely not. But I definitely um, resonated with, I think it was Apollonia that said, feel the fear and just do it. Yeah, so each one of you have the capability to to step out here. And no one, this is a safe space for everyone that comes to this class because this is a super inclusive class. While you may come along the path in your journey where you are you may have this profound type of strength, I, I have to tell you all that it's that, that profound strength that you have is going to be a, a blessing to help another person come up and find their profound strength. Some of you may be strong in saying, I'm going to take that next step. But then there's, there, there might come a time where you say, after you receive that success, you might say, well, wait a second. Hold on a second. You have something called imposter syndrome. Has anyone ever heard of imposter syndrome? Go ahead, Angel. Yeah, I, I've heard of it. Uh, I, I, I could say, too, that I've experienced it at some point in my professional life where I worked alongside of peers that I felt may have been more qualified than I was when we both were or when we were performing the same duties and roles. And, and isn't that a sort of intimidation all by itself to, to sit there with people? You look around and say, wow, for some of you, you're stepping into the same world as Snoop Dogg. For some of you, you're stepping into the same world as 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 uh, I hate to use all the names in the world, but uh, Fendi and Gucci and Prada. For some of you, you're stepping into the world of of, of Steve Jobs, of of Zuckerberg. For some of you, you're stepping into roles of that have never even been created. And you're supposed to what? Just all of a sudden wake up with confidence. Biggest lie ever told. Biggest lie ever told that I wake up like this. Entrepreneurs don't wake up like this. Entrepreneurs work up like this. Okay. It means that you get within yourself and you work up like this. So we all start at the bottom step and we just work up a little bit at a time. We fail, we get back up and try a little bit more. We fail again, we try again a little bit more. And some of us, we fail our entire lives because there are plenty of case studies about business, business owners who said they tried their whole lives to elevate to the next level. And you think all the consultants in the world should help them get there. But do they help them get there? No. Because all things can't be fixed with an outside or in, uh, an internal consultant. Sometimes we have to consult things holistically in our own lives. You can make millions of dollars, billions of dollars, and still be unsuccessful. Who disagrees with that comment? You can make millions and billions of dollars and still be unsuccessful. Who disagrees with that comment? That's another reason. I would have to respectfully disagree. It's a matter of perspective. How would one accumulate all that money without building some sort of or acquiring some sort of success? Oh, that's good, Angel. That's good. That's good. Angel has some pushback. Anybody else have some pushback? Anyone else? You can raise your hand. You can dump something in the chat. Malcolm, what's your take on it? Man, I'm biased. I, I think when you really look at it, the quality of life of an average American now is higher than any of the, you know, of the royalty of, of yesteryear. And so when people say success, the average quote unquote successful person now is way more successful than any king and queen of like 1910. And so I feel like, um, you know, our society has done a really good hit job on our psyche of equating the access to capital with a quality of life when you can have a high quality of life with limited access to capital. 
And I want to say Angel was Angel and Malcolm are point on to me. In fact, the reason why they're so point on is because it causes for us to dig down into what does it mean to be successful? And then also, what does it mean to be achieved? Can one be achieved and have great achievements without feeling personally successful? I'm looking at Satoshi's situation and, 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 and the humility in which he so generously shared with us. And he said, in myself, I feel like I have everything ready to go. Do you know there's, there's probably a certain percentage of the population that would say that's success, to have your business ready to launch? But to him, he's not quite there yet. He feels like, I just don't know if I want to step out and put my stuff out there. But you see, even though he's achieved this level, he might not feel successful. Apollonia was just in here, and I believe she came to us last time. Apollonia came to us with the Blendar, the Blendar that she was selling. Uh, such great product name placement, everything like that. I could remember it. I could plug it into my USB on my computer and have a blend R. But she says she soaked thousands of dollars into her business. But she might see herself as a success. And then, like Angel said, it's so subjective. How are we to know? But then Angel said something else. He said, how, how can we look at this life we're living and see someone who's achieved this level of this dollar amount and not think that they, they had some form of success. What if that success is only monetary? What if they did wake up like that from an investment in 2020 in, um, in crypto, they woke up a year later after an $8,000 investment and they became a billionaire at $5.7 billion. That's true, Apollonia. Success is in the eye of the beholder. Success is also a construct. It's something that you can't touch. So it leads us back to this very important discussion that we've been talking about today in terms of business finance, money. As we begin to dive deeper into that, I'm going to need each one of you to activate your senses and start to deploy in your mind, what are the faults I have in my thinking about money? What are the challenges that I face in my own personal spending and my personal finance? What are the personal habits that I have that will create a challenge in my business? And that will hinder my progress. And what are the most positive things that I carry that will help? Here, frugality is a good thing. Andrew said it many times. I plan to charge my client for the materials in my deposit. Andrew said, I'm not coming out of my pocket. In theory, that's what I believe I understood Andrew to say. I'm not coming out of my pocket. For a dime, my client needs to pay this up front. That's a good way to stay frugal. So as we end off the class, we want you all to consider these things. When you see us again on Thursday, how are my ideas about money going to interact with my business's progress? Because the failure might not be that I have a poor performing product. It could be that I am just a little irresponsible when it comes to managing the finances that I have. Malcolm. Thanks, Steve. Oh, Apollonia. Oh, I was just going to state that, um, yeah, I, I feel like I'm a success because um, I've invested so much into my business and it doesn't it doesn't even feel like I invested so much because I love like I believe in myself and I love myself. So it's not really like the money is not really a big thing for me. Like I would 
I would continue, I would invest tens of thousands of dollars into myself and into my business because I believe in myself that, that much. I'd love to hear that. I th- I want to keep encouraging um, everyone to, to feel that way. Um, especially as you, you know, as you continue on this business journey, you'll start to realize that when you see yourself as your final line of defense, it, it, re-energizes the urgency and really clarifies the the daily habits that need to be formed to execute on. So keep that, keep that attitude. Um, I... Malcolm, you went on mute for a second there. Oh, wow. I'm clicking my, I'm, my elbow hit the hand. I um, <clears throat> believe we're approaching the end of class here. Um, I, I, like I mentioned before, this particular section on capital, finance, budgeting, these fancy terms for monies, monies, money teams, um, these, these topics we will slow down on and we, we will have, um, if need be, maybe in a, like an office hours, we'll maybe send out an email to kind of get a figure for that. Because the next section or what we will be leading into is data literacy. Um, and so that's just fancy for how do I read my numbers? Um, because the, the very nature of a lot of these distributed work models or, you know, being able to work from home is the ability, ability to read a report and see the numbers and make a decision um, or, or, or be able to read the numbers and say, hmm, this don't add up right. Um, and so this applies to not only the 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 finance part, you know, the budgeting, but also to how do I measure my my deals? How do I measure how many customers I got? How do I keep track of, you know, these different aspects? So you guys are already using these skills in your personal life. Whenever you try to make, you know, plan your trips, look for stuff in the grocery store, uh, these, these types of assessments or Huh, let me double check real quick. That that mentality is what we're gonna dig deeper into because that once you have a good foundation on on the number, number of properties and data literacy, your ability to grow and converse with higher level entrepreneurs is just gonna be unending. Um, so that's what I wanted to end the class on with that is we we quickly went over um the fundamentals of what to use d- debt for, what we use credit for, how we orient ourselves to budgeting from a from a mental model to an execution daily standpoint. Um, oh, Angel has to jump off here. Um, so I'm gonna stop, stop there. If anyone else have any question, I'm gonna hang around for a couple moments, but um, I just wanted to whet the appetite for next class. And feel free to get feel free to send us uh, an email. Um, you have it in the invitation there. If you have a question or something comes to mind, we'll uh, bring it up next time. Uh, certainly want you all to have access to us in that way. Uh, other than that, uh, again, if you don't have any questions, you can feel free to go at this time, and uh, we'll close off the class. Thank Andrea, you, Andrea. Please. Oh, hey, Steve, a uh, quick question. I was wondering, because you you brought up some really great questions just about, I think, kind of dissecting uh, money. Um, would you be able to perhaps maybe like um, either reinstate the question about what you had asked um, in terms of our limiting beliefs about money? Or maybe if we can put it in an email, because I thought it was really great to just kind of go over personally. Oh, absolutely. I don't, I don't mind reinstating at all. Um, in fact, the the primary statement revolves around our attitudes about money and also what happens when we when we carry our pretty much our worldview about money into our business life so do our businesses that we plan to open or that we currently run suffer from our personal our personal attitudes about money, our personal history with money, our personal beliefs that maybe we acquired 
from our parents, our family, our culture, our community, our circumstances about money. And I'd like for each person to digest what are their beliefs about money so that when you sit with that, you then can know, well, then why is my business having a challenge? Oh, because, well, maybe I'm so scared that I'll run out of materials or that I won't have clients. I spend too much money on marketing. But instead of spending so much money on marketing, why not look for frugal ways to do free marketing? Perhaps you offer a free class to the community. Perhaps you offer free, ch free shirts to a local school because little, little children can run around in some of your designs for free. you would be like, well, wait a second, that costs me money. It does cost you time. It may cost you a little material, but the advertising of someone knowing that you're offering something to the community can be really good for you. But you might not consider that if you are living in a lifestyle of fear, thinking that if I don't spend, it will go away from me. In, 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 in financial terms, we use a, uh, a phrase called a fear of missing out. Fear of missing out. FOMO. That is also a product of behaviors from our belief systems about finances. Now, the Wilson twins, uh, that um, I know that's not your name. Uh, there's been so much, uh, so much going on. Did you have anything you wanted to speak on today? No, I just um, first wanted to apologize for making it late. I work at an after school program and in runs during this time. So I usually can't. Um, and by the way, it's Watisha Patterson. But I usually can't get on when it first starts because we have over 50 children. But once I get down to about 10 or 15, then I come in, which is around this time. So I just be grateful for the time to be able to come in and listen to what I can listen to. And I really want to say thank you guys for your time. I appreciate it. No, we appreciate you. Uh, thank you for taking time to be in those after school programs for children. I'll, I'll make a record hey, of it and say uh, it now. Miss <laughs> um, Patterson, you are the reason why so many parents at this moment can go ahead and make that extra money um, for their children. You're the reason why so many parents right now can go ahead and rest easy because they know you're there um, taking care of their children uh, while they are uh, working to make some some more money, maybe to meet rent or to um, be able to pay a light bill or to buy food. So your work is not uh, taken for granted in this room. Uh, we certainly appreciate you spending any moment you have to give to us. We really appreciate that and we value it and we validate it and we appreciate you. Um, Apollonia. Yeah, so um, next week is when we're going to be discussing the money and financial literacy, correct? Uh, no, ma'am. This week we're going to we're going to um, we're going to dig more into it this week, actually. Oh, so okay. this, yes, this this segment of uh, this this period that we're in is going to uh, basically conclude with uh, more of a detail, a detailed look at um, uh, input and output, uh, what you spend yeah. on, what you what you uh, what you what you charge. Um, mm -hmm. And so we're going to we're going to dig in that. But we're, we are going a little bit slower just because we are dealing with numbers. And it's not about leaving anyone behind or making anyone feel less than in this setting. We want equity. So that equity means that we, we take questions in real time because sometimes our questions help other people have questions and those questions lead to even more questions and then we end up learning together. Right. So I just wanted to speak on the, the uh, money situation. I'm uh, personally with uh, like my own background coming from like a low income community and I'm noticing with uh, when I did like vendor pop ups and other local entrepreneur uh, events is that with a lot of minorities, um, they lack like financial literacy. 
And so we kind of get stuck in this small business cycle and everything is like small, small. And we really don't like um, kind of scale our business up. Um, so we get stuck in this small business cycle. And um, that's something that I don't want to be stuck in so that's why I really am going for the Blendar Babes brand to make the smoothies an actual brand and not just like a small business smoothie cafe or something like that but actually a brand and I'm I'm going to the library and getting books on budgeting and financial literacy because this isn't something that was taught in my family or you know in my in my household so I'm just you know taking every day, taking a little time to just educate myself and going to the library and, and getting into those books because I feel like that's the only way I'm going to learn. Well, that's that's a great way to learn. And then your those books give you an opportunity, a, a platform to spring off and come to class and say, well, I read this. Would y'all mind speaking on this and see you're working with real people here? We're not we're not robots. You see, when people sign up for college education or distance learning or evening classes, sometimes they get robots. Right. You need to teach a curriculum at this pace. We have to test. We have to make sure we have outcomes. We have to make. No, we're here to make sure that each one of you have, are impacted by what we say. If you're a trainer going out into the community, we want you, the next thousand people you train, to see what training should look like. We want to rewrite what the best practice is. It's not about going through the most slides. It's about actually digging down and effectively working with the people that show up. Malcolm? Yeah, I am um, to... to to get more detail, Apollonia, because you seem to be more hungry for those details, what we're going to get into specifically is going to be around um, the three income statements that you should be able to read, or excuse me, the three financial statements you should be able to read, a balance sheet, an income statement, a cash flow statement. We're going to get into where these statements should live, whether you do them analog, like a manual way, whether you do them um, digitally, so using a software to, to um, connect to your bank account, grab those transactions and distill them in a way. Um, and then we're gonna go into um, tools that um, communicate with these different, you know, debits and credits, right? So let's use an explicit example. Um, in my experience, some entrepreneurs use a tool called Wave Accounting. Okay, so what that means is anytime, you know, the entrepreneur charges their client, um, whether they send them a purchase order or they send them a, 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 a PayPal request, that gets tracked into their wave accounting as and, and labeled either income or expenses. Once that's, once that's taken care of, you as an entrepreneur need to be able to go in and check everything. So that's what I mean by taking this mental model of debit and credits and genuinely getting to the the minutia of day to day running a business. Um, and so I wanted to give you those terms so that you can look this up on your own and other people who are maybe who are on this journey as well can look that up on their own because this is the lingo and the and the terms and the and the slang. However, y'all want to use this. These are the vocab that your accountant's gonna to wanna to see, that your investor's gonna to wanna to see. I mean, shoot, just just yourself, the, the person in the mirror, they need to be able to see, <laughs> they need to be able to see these terms. So um, that's what we're gonna be getting into. Um, so I don't mean to beat a dead horse here, but I just, I'm very explicit about expectations and being held accountable to what I say. And so that's where we're going. Um, I think we're actually approaching the end of the class. So I want to, leave a couple more minutes for anyone else and ask any questions. If not, I'm, uh, we're going to end it at 7, uh, uh, 5.45, excuse me. Thank you. And we've put in the uh, wave that he was talking about right there. We will revisit that in the next class. Um, please go to that website. Again, these are not endorsements from us. These are simply items that we have used for ourselves. You also will get a chance to learn more from there. 
Um, and uh, while books may be outdated from time to time, it's hard to know what resource online to go to. And we will be dropping these gems in these uh, messages for you all to enjoy. Um, I don't know if Mr. Ray is on this call. Mr. Ray, would you like to say something before we close out of here? You've been so quiet. I appreciate you for, uh, for opening this forum up for us. Mr. Ray might be busy right now. Um, but uh, again, thank you all very much for your time. Um, we are going to go ahead and close out the class. So um, again, look forward to seeing you all, I believe, uh, on Wednesday. And if you ever miss anything, we will definitely be able to jump back in uh, with the YouTube recording. Malcolm. Yeah, that's it. You guys have a good night. You guys take care. Bye-bye now.